Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jason McClellan. I'm with Insurance Advisors Direct. And today we're going to be talking about the big question. How do you properly choose an FMO? Actually, that's a question that we hear quite often over the last few years amongst independent insurance agents. Um, it's a question that comes up often, frequently. Um, how do I choose an FMO? Uh, which one's right for me? Uh, where do I go to ask these questions and get unbiased advice? So what we've decided to do is we're, we've created two different uh, training platforms uh, and tools to assist you. Now, just to understand where this information is coming from, I'll give you a little background on myself. Uh, again, my name is Jason McClellan. I have actually been in the insurance industry. I started and became licensed as an agent back in 1997, um, roughly around 26 years ago. Um, I worked in the senior life and health space. And after a few years of doing that, I decided to move into a different division of that organization I worked with. And uh, that was their marketing or what would be the early days of an FMO model. And I worked in that division for another 14 years, uh, traveling the country, uh, working with independent agents, training them, supporting them, doing everything that uh, an FMO should be doing. And I did that for probably, as I mentioned, 14 years. After uh, being at that organization for quite a number of years, I decided to leave and start uh, this organization, Insurance Advisors Direct, back in 2010. Uh, we are an FMO, have a very robust platform of services and support. Uh, many of those are speaking to things that independent agents have been asking for and needing for many, many years. And we have developed a very robust and sophisticated platform to service those needs, speaking specifically to what we see being asked for amongst agents. But I say these just to let you know that the information we're here to present today, uh, we hope this information is beneficial, hopefully it helps answer some of your questions and your concerns, and hope that it makes uh, it easier for you to make a wise decision while you're choosing your FMO partner. Additionally, my father worked in the insurance industry. Uh, he was also an agent. He also worked at an FMO for many years prior to me getting into the industry. So when I decided to choose insurance as a career, of course, not only was he there to support me, but I had had quite a few years of seeing the inner workings of the insurance industry and the FMO space, what FMOs did, what they should be doing, what they represented, how they worked with independent insurance agents. And obviously, getting into that industry myself, I've spent the last 26 years getting a very in-depth education. So I say this just to let you know that the information uh, that we talk about here today in our video series and our downloads, this is information that comes from experience. This is not something that me or my team has simply read in a chat room, not something we read in an article. This is something that we do daily, that we work with independent agents on a daily basis. We are in the FMO space. We are having these conversations, having these questions asked on a daily basis. So we hope that this information can be beneficial, maybe help guide you in your search for the right FMO, hopefully answer some questions you might have about FMOs and their value. And we hope that these beneficial to you in your search for the proper part. All right. Well, welcome to our video series on how to choose an FMO. Now, our first video is going to contain three specific points, the good FMOs, the bad FMOs, and the ugly. So today, we're going to take you through those three. And we're even going to talk a little bit about what makes a great FMO. So additional features and services and support that you might find that really takes a good FMO to a whole nother level. But certainly, importantly, we're going to talk about what is a bad FMO, things to avoid, and what is out there that's ugly. So things to really avoid, be careful of, and you may want to avoid at all costs. So we're going to get into that now. Now, don't forget to download our Choosing an FMO Guide. And beyond just talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, we've got a bonus for you. Our bonus is we're going to talk about the question, which has come up the last couple of years. Should I work with organizations that have recently sold? Maybe they've sold to a public company, maybe a private company, maybe they've sold out to a private equity firm, a venture capitalist. Those are some of the terms, VCs, other things that you might hear 
That's what those mean. So we're going to talk a little bit about those organizations and shed light on maybe some miscommunication on those organizations. Stay tuned for that as well. One of the reasons we're bringing this up is because we see a lot of interest in this topic. We see it being talked about in industry events. We get questions from agents who may find us on the internet and they want to ask these questions. Maybe you're new to this industry. Maybe you've been in it for a while, but you need to have someone that can help you get to that next level. So it's a very important topic. And there are some mistakes that could be made along the way that could be detrimental to your business. So we're going to talk about those and help you to avoid those, help you to make the right decision. One thing I would caution everyone, because we do see this so talked about and asked about frequently, is be careful where you're asking these questions. Why do I say that? Well, remember that when you're in those chat groups, when you're in those Facebook groups, sure, there are many agents involved in those Facebook groups. But if you ask, hey, who's the right FMO? Well, how do you know that the right FMO for them is the right FMO for you? Maybe they had a particular product or a particular service in mind, which is why they chose that one. Maybe that's complete opposite for you. The other thing to be mindful of is remember, many of those groups are run by FMOs. Well, who do you think they're going to tell you is the right FMO? Well, they're going to steer you back to them and tell you all the great reasons why. The same thing goes with other FMOs who might be looking at those questions. See, they're going in or they're having people go in and talk about their company to push you towards their product. Now, does that mean it's a bad company? It doesn't, but it may not be the right one for you. So when you're asking on those groups, sometimes those questions, as you're being steered to the group that runs that, that's a bit self-serving. So be mindful of that. Just be careful uh, when you're putting those questions out there. So who do you ask? Well, I think it's important, and that's what we're going to do today, is talk about some of the questions you should ask, some of the things you should be considering, so that if, let's say, you're interviewing these FMOs, you can go in with an education, you can go in with the proper questions, You can go in with an understanding of what your needs are, and you can talk about those and decide for yourself who is the right partner for you. So that's what we're going to talk uh, quite a bit about today. Um, You might also want to talk to agents maybe in your local area. If you're going to some events, hey, who do you work with? Now, some of the follow-up questions to that should be, why do you work with them? What do they do for you? What do they provide that makes you continue to partner with them? Those are some questions that would help you determine if that may be the right partner for you, because it may be the right partner for them, but it might not necessarily be the right partner for you. So just a side note there, kind of a warning, be careful who you're asking who the right FMO is, that you're not just being pushed back to the organization who's answering that question. So let's get into this. Let's talk about the FMO channel. The FMO channel is an extremely valuable one. If you are uh, working with the right organization, if you are partnered for certain reasons, FMOs can be, bring a tremendous amount of value if they're doing it right. Okay, And that's what we're going to get into next. As a matter of fact, we're going to talk about the good or great FMOs. We're going to talk about the bad FMOs. And then some of the ugly ones we see out there that you should absolutely avoid. I'm going to try to speak to a lot of the questions that we get from agents or that we see being asked amongst the agent community. So let's talk about that. What makes up a good FMO? And there are many good ones out there. There are even some great ones out there. And in fact, we're going to provide a helpful tool uh, after our videos You can download this tool that gives you all of the checkpoints and answers what great FMOs should be providing, what you could expect from them. It kind of gives you a mental checklist that you can go through to determine if the organization you're looking at is the great FMO that you are looking to partner with. We've got some tools that we would love to provide as well. So good FMO. A good FMO should have some key attributes. Uh, First off, it should be a true partnership experience. Uh, They should be set up uh, and engaged with you that you feel like it is a partner that is truly concerned 
about helping you with your needs and helping your business to grow. That's a true partnership. Uh, and that's how you should feel with that group. It should be about you. It should be about your needs. It should be about your organization and how they can help you. Not just about, hey, we've got this tool and we've got this tool. You know, again, it's easy to make those sound like a nice product or resource that may offer very little value to you. It's a true partnership experience about your needs. The next thing is, is <laughs> this sounds basic. But this is actually very true and has become a problem out there. But they actually return your calls. They return your emails, text messages in a timely manner. And they get back to you on situations or issues quickly. And even if there isn't an immediate solution, they communicate with you. Okay, It's interesting. I was on a FMO panel at a Medicare conference a few years ago. And I'm there with some of the other leadership of national FMOs. And that was the question. What is a good FMO? And hands down, we all said the same thing, that we hear all the time from agents. They're looking for a new partner because they don't even get their phone calls returned. A good FMO seems basic, but they actually get back to you. Okay, so make sure that you're familiar with that. Their platforms, their services. They are designed to help you in your business. They should also be a partner helping to save you money, maybe to contribute to some of your marketing or your lead costs, or maybe some of your business overhead expenses. Maybe they've got bonus structures that you can participate in. Maybe you even like agent incentives. Maybe that motivates you. So maybe it's even something that just motivates you to get out there and work harder. Maybe they work with you on your business plan. Maybe they continue to follow up with you on your business plan to make sure you're on track. You know, when you're an independent agent, you're out there. And I talked to independent agents who have been doing this for 30 plus years, very successful. And they call and sometimes say, hey, sometimes I just need someone to talk to. I need someone to vent to. I need somebody who's going to call me and hold me accountable because I'm the only one holding me accountable on a daily basis. So maybe your FMO partner should also be involved in doing that working with you, pushing you, holding you accountable. It's a partnership. You know, FMOs exist to service the agent community. You are the lifeline or the lifeblood of an FMO. Without you, FMOs wouldn't be needed. They don't exist. So we work on your behalf. So make sure that the partnership is there to help you grow. That company is not just trying to get your contract from you. You know, I know some F FMOs, their goal is to get a contract from you and they don't care about helping you grow your business. Their goal is they just want one piece of business out of you for the entire year. That feeds their bottom line. That's not a partnership. You know, they're there just to check a box. And if they check that box enough times with enough agents, they make money. That isn't something you want. You want someone that's going to help you grow. And as you know, the FMO world, that's our compensation. We only get compensated when we help you sell and when we help you grow. So you should have an FMO that's motivated to help you grow your business. That's a good FMO. And some of those attributes would also contribute to being a great FMO. So let's talk about the next one. Now, this is the stay away from. Next one is the bad FMOs. Okay, what to look for, what to be cautious of. Well, first off, the simple one is they don't return your phone calls. They don't get back to you, like your emails, text messages. They don't get your problems solved. If it's a contracting issue, it just drags on forever. There's no communication. You contract with them because they tell you about all these wonderful things they're going to do, and you never hear from them again. They just disappear. Why? Because, well, that department just checked that box. They got your contract. That's it. Now it's up to you to go do the work. That's an organization that's not interested in a true partnership. They need to get back to you. They need to return your calls, and they need to respond and deliver on the promises that they offered and communicate, keep in touch. The contracting is just the beginning of that relationship, not the end. Many treat it as the end. The other things that bad FMOs do is they offer a limited support or resources. Maybe you can see that on their website, or you might see that from their printed material. Very basic, you know, not well thought out. Limited resources. Maybe they even want to charge you for resources. Resources that should naturally come as a partnership. That should be free of cost to you. Uh, you have enough expenses as a business owner. FMOs are designed to bring you solutions and tools and platforms and resources at no cost. We see a lot of FMOs out there that are taking some of their services, just packaging them 
up. They exist already and they want to sell them to you. Well, I don't think that's the makeup of a good FMO. So access to tremendous amount of resources, different teams, different individuals have expertise in areas that you as a business owner and as a salesperson, independent insurance agent need. So keep an eye out for the platform of resources. Also be mindful of organizations that don't ask questions. You know, if it's about you, it's a, if it's about your company, your business and your growth, they need to know who you are. They need to know what you want. Well, if they don't ask those questions, it means they don't care. It means that their job is to get your contract, hope that you're going to put some business on, and that's kind of the end of it. Or instead of talking to you about what your needs are and how their platform works and all the solutions they have for you, they just talk about money. You know, I'm going to give you more money. I'm going to pay you more than, than the next organization. If it's all about money, then that's maybe the only thing they have. Now, if that's all that's important to you and you could care less about quality service and good support and a team behind you and access to resources, maybe that's the organization for you. You know, you may not expect much more, but they'll give you a little more money. Uh, now, I think great FMOs can still deliver on the money side, but they can deliver on all of the other important aspects. So have that conversation with a good or a great FMO and see what they can do. But again, if everything with that FMO is about money, they probably don't have much more to offer. Let's see some of the other things. A lack of experience. We see a lot of local, regional, and even so-called national FMOs coming onto the scene that have very limited experience. Maybe they were an agent. Maybe they have a small agency and they achieved some form of an FMO contract. So now they can go out and recruit agencies as an FMO. But do they have the infrastructure? Do they have the knowledge, the experience to actually bring independent agents the solutions and needs they have? In many cases, no, but they have that contract. So be mindful of the experience there. You know, you want an organization or individuals within that organization that have years and years of experience working with you as an independent agent. That means they have access to tools, they have access to personnel, people, contracts, carriers that they can go into on your behalf and deliver better quality items and solutions, or maybe essentially new opportunities, leads, other things that uh, would be important to you. So experience is extremely important. Also, you can tell they're just a product or a contract pusher. You might want to keep looking. Some of those organizations or the people within those organizations, that that's literally all they do. They just want to gobble up as many contracts as possible. They want to make it easy. They want you to check 15 boxes to contract with as many carriers as possible because they hope if they throw enough of that against the wall, you'll put some business there and they'll make some money and they've achieved that goal that they have. That's not the purpose of an FMO. As a matter of fact, we have conversations and you should be having conversations about those true needs, solutions that make sense. In many cases, you might not need 10 solutions. Maybe you need one or two new carriers or products to solve the need of your clients. Or if you're getting into the business, maybe you only need a couple carrier contracts to get started. You see, you do much more than that. It becomes a bit overwhelming and you might get lost in those products and not even know why you picked up those contracts. But see, some organizations don't care. They just want you to contract with more companies. So be mindful if you can tell somebody's just pushing contracts on you and they just want you to get contracted, you might want to keep looking. Additionally, within the bad FMOs, we see organizations that actually will tell you that they want to partner with you and all these great things they'll do for you, but they're actually competing against you. Remember, I mentioned there are organizations, maybe they're agents or small agencies that may have earned or maybe they've negotiated an FMO contract. Now they're out there trying to introduce these products and recruit independent agents to these contracts. But in all reality, they're still an agent. They're still going out in that community. They're still going out and competing against you. Okay, So you may want to look for an FMO that truly focuses in on just being an FMO that is just working with downline independent agents. Now you may say, well, that's not a big deal. You know, it's a big space. Well, here's where it is a big deal. We have insurance organizations and carriers that come to us all the time with lead opportunities. They wanna put us into community events. They wanna pay for those community events. They wanna pay for seminars. They're doing advertising and community 
marketing and outreach on their own, where do those leads go? Many of those carriers need to shuffle them to us as FMOs. Many of those carriers will come to us and say, hey, here's a chunk of dollars to use for marketing or lead generation for your agents. Now, organizations that are out there doing it on their own, guess where those leads go? Guess where those marketing dollars go? Well, they go to feed themselves. You'll never hear about them. They'll never talk to you about them because they're using them. Why? Because it makes them more money to go out, sell that product on their own, make a commission, plus maybe make their administrative fee or make the additional compensation that they're earning as an FMO. So in turn, they don't want to give you those leads. They don't want to pass through those marketing dollars. So that's where it becomes very important. Are you working with an FMO that is there to support you and your needs? Or are you working with an FMO that essentially is there to take your contract, but in turn is going to compete against you? They're going to keep those leads. They're going to keep those marketing dollars in-house. That's why it becomes extremely important. And that's just one example. There are many other examples of why you want to be cautious when you're working with an organization that claims to be an FMO, but is actually competing against you in that space. So that would round out some of the top reasons why I would categorize an organization as a bad FMO. Now, hold on to your seats. This is where it gets bad. There's the ugly. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about that. This is where you really need to be careful because this could be a very unfortunate mistake if you moved in the direction of working with one of these organizations. What can make up or constitute a real ugly FMO? Well, first off, there are organizations, it's unfortunate they exist, but they do, that have shady contracting or commission tax. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, in some cases, you know, you might not be aware, but you might be signing your book of business or potentially your commissions to that organization. They now are actually taking ownership of your sales, of your book of business. If that is the case, you want to run quickly. Do not do business with those organizations. We've seen it happen way too many times where organizations will send you contracting, check certain boxes, have you sign, you sign, it gets sent back in, and all of a sudden you realize you're now being paid those commissions directly from that agency and not the carrier. On a true independent agent contract, you should be paid directly by the carrier. There are very few instances where a carrier requires an FMO to pay. And if that is the case, you will have that clarification in the contract and you will hear that from the carrier. But 99% of the time, you should be getting your commission direct from the carrier, making sure that your contract is direct, you own that book of business, your commissions are direct, and you are vested immediately. So be very careful. Not only do you lose control of your book of business, but as you move on down the road, Maybe you grow, you want to expand, maybe you have a better opportunity and you want to leave, guess what happens? Those organizations, I've seen it too many times, they now want to hold those clients and those commissions hostage, and it could be a very difficult and costly change for you. Or you might feel stuck. And what happens if you stay? Well, you're just compounding the problem. You're now feeding into a bigger problem by assigning those commissions and losing control. So be very, very careful of that. Ugly, you might want to also be mindful. There are organizations, they'll promise all these resources. They will offer a lot of support, maybe lead generation, marketing dollars. They'll offer you more commissions. And you go, wow, this is more commissions than anybody's offered me. Why is that? Well, in some cases, carriers have limits as to what commission levels we can actually offer. And we know that if we offer a higher commission to you, it might not be possible. If that higher commission level is offered to you, it sounds great. You submit the paperwork. You're now committed to that organization. And guess what comes back? The company comes back and goes, hey, sorry, Jason, we can't put you at that level. It looks like you're not qualified yet. But don't worry. We're going to get you put at the level where you belong. And we're going to help you grow into that. Well, guess what they've just done? They've given you the level that everybody else was offering that was legitimately being offered because we knew that's what you were eligible for, but they lured you in with false promises of a higher contract, knowing you wouldn't get it. And then when it came back, but you were already in the system, now you're locked in. Now they hope you go write some business. That's unfortunate to be tricked into a relationship like that. And it happens a lot. But those are extremely ugly situations. And again, if that happens to you, if you see it, 
make sure you go the other direction and find a different FMO. The other thing that some of the bad ones are doing is they will not allow for releases or transfers. They will obviously threaten to keep your commissions and your clients if they own those, but they will hold your contract hostage for as long as possible. So you may want to have a conversation. What is the release process of an organization? Now they can tell you whatever they want. So it does have to be backed by maybe some proof. Maybe you want something in writing, or it has to be backed by maybe local testimonials saying, yes, they are. It is true. They're willing to do that. But there are some bad ones and there's some big ones that are bad and that will not release. Okay, they will hold that contract hostage as long as possible. Now, many carriers have fixed that by offering like an intent to transfer or a period of time where you can eventually move. But it's unfortunate that you have to be stuck with organizations that aren't supporting you. And if you're writing business, they're essentially making money on doing nothing. So that is unfortunate. The other thing that uh, I don't like when I see, and I'm seeing more of this, is FMOs that come to you with all these services all this support. But in order to get it, you have to bring all your contracts over to them. Or you have to bring a minimum amount of contracts and they have to be specific carriers. Well, that's not why FMOs exist. You know, we might be very good. Some of us are very versatile across many product lines. Some are not. But if you approach an organization, maybe because they have a tool or maybe a product that you need, and some resources, they should be delivering that to you from contract one, okay? If an organization tells you that you have to bring every contract to them to get their support, that's a bad, that's an ugly FMO, okay? Don't work with them. You know, go find somebody else that's willing to support you, give you those resources without a heavy commitment. Because more than likely what that organization is trying to do is they're trying to make it so difficult for you to ever leave them that they don't have to be good. They don't have to deliver on those promises because they've got you. It's tough to move all those contracts away and they're banking on that. So be very careful if organizations want you to bring all their contracts. You should be getting that same level of service and support with just one contract. Okay. Now we hope to earn more, but that's the key is we should be earning more and not demanding it. So be very careful of that. The other thing that has become kind of an ugly practice, in my opinion, is they actually make you pay for some of these services or their training. So here they're this experts in a field. Now as an expert or as an FMO, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be experts. We're supposed to help you be able to grow your business, overcome challenges, see challenges before they come at you, avoid costly mistakes. That's what a good FMO is there to do. But instead they get your contract or in addition to getting your contract, they tell you, well, if you want to learn our tricks, now you got to pay to attend one of our services, or you got to pay for one of our sales packages, or you got to pay to come to one of our events, or, oh, that tool, yeah, it's a very valuable tool, uh, but now you have to pay for that tool. You see, FMOs shouldn't be charging you and trying to make money on the tools that they're bringing to you. That's part of being an FMO, training, expertise shouldn't be held hostage for you to pay for it, especially many agents who are just getting into the business are fooled to think they need to pay for some of these programs when there's good, great quality FMOs out there offering these training programs and solutions at no cost, events at no cost. You can go partner with somebody who values your business and your relationship more than what you can pay them for things they should already be delivering. I think that makes up a fairly ugly FMO, in my opinion. So where are we? Well, we have tackled quite a few subjects, tackled quite a few questions, I hope. We have talked about a little bit about the great, but mostly about the good and the bad and the ugly. And hopefully this has given you some insight into the world of FMOs and giving you some questions or understanding so that you can avoid making mistakes. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about, but has become an extremely hot topic is what about FMOs that are merging, being bought by other private organizations? Maybe they're being bought by 
publicly traded organizations or that big PE, private equity? What do you do? Are they bad? Are they evil? Are they good, bad, or... So as a bonus, let's talk about that. I did not want to include those organizations into any one of the other categories we just talked about. I will tell you this. If you go on forums, you go to chat groups, you will see organizations, uh, professional organizations and agents that will bash uh, these companies, these FMOs that are being bought by private equity groups. Okay. Well, I would caution you. I believe that that, those blanket statements and accusations are very self-serving. Okay. Those organizations are trying to make other organizations look bad so that they can benefit and reap some rewards from that. And that's why I didn't put any of those organizations into any one of those categories. You know, many of those organizations, the the small, medium, the the national, large ones that have maybe merged or been bought. I've worked with those organizations. I know their leadership. I could even call some of those owners my friends. Are they bad organizations? Not all of them. But like any business, like any industry, yeah, there are some not so great ones, but there are some really good ones. So how do we approach looking for an FMO, knowing that maybe some of them have been recently acquired? Do we look at that as a good thing, a bad thing? Where do we place those organizations? Well, as I mentioned before, some of those are very good organizations themselves. But I think what's important is that you go into a discussion or possibly a contract with some appropriate thought to what you're getting into, okay? What it is today, what it could become. So let's talk a little bit about those structures. Okay, now some of those organizations that have been acquired, I know I've spoken with. And I know some of them have gone through those acquisitions to bring additional resources, bring additional dollars into their company so that they can enhance their services. Some of them have done it so they can go out and start acquiring agencies or books of business or other FMOs or MGAs. So part of it depends on, is the organization a quality organization, a good organization, or um, were they bad to begin with? Chances are, if they were bad to begin with, they're not going to get any better. But if they're a good organization, I think it's important for you to understand why did they, uh, why were they acquired? What was the intent behind it? Was it to better their organization or was it simply to just sell out? Now, I know some organizations uh, that that is the purpose. They have spent years and years building an organization. This was kind of time for them to to cash out. Um, and their goal in the very short term is to take those dollars and they're moving on, maybe into retirement, which they've earned. But what does that mean for that organization? If your contracts are with that organization, what does that mean for you? Is there someone there at the helm to continue to lead and to uh, you know support you and their other downline agents in the ways that you expect? Okay, so you do have to ask those questions. And you do have to be mindful of what the intentions were. Now, the other thing I would warn you is anytime you are now working for an organization that is either publicly traded or answers to private equity firms, even the ones that exist today, but what about the new private equity that comes in in a few years? Those organizations, bottom line, expect results. They expect growth in sales, revenue. And if that's not the case, then changes are made, okay? So even though those organizations tell you, hey, we're the same, nothing's going to change, there is no guarantee of that, and they don't have control over that anymore. I will say that. They do not have control because now somebody else who handed them all those dollars, they are in control. The board, the investors, they are now in control. And what does happen the larger those organizations get, uh, consolidation, 
you know, think about just two simple things, which are extremely important to agents, but think about contracting and think about uh, just your agent support, your general support that you need. If they own hundreds of organizations across the country, do they need hundreds of support people scattered all over, hundreds of contracting people scattered all over, thousands? Well, remember, from their standpoint and their view, uh, employees are overhead. Okay. Now, if I need to come up with quick revenue and I need to increase my overhead, I'm sorry, decrease my overhead, increase my profitability, the easiest way to do that is to eliminate overhead. The fastest way to do that is to eliminate salaries and hourly employees. I hate to say it, but would there be a consolidation? Would those organizations decide, well, we're going to consolidate. Now we just need X amount of service people and X amount of contracting people, and that's all they do. Well, maybe those were some of the people that kept you uh, working for that organization. They may be downsized. They may be eliminated. So remember that when you hear all things are staying the same, there is no guarantee. There's no guarantee amongst any organization or even this industry that things will stay the same. But when somebody else is making those decisions and it is now out of the control of those organizations that used to be privately held, see, that is a promise they cannot live up to. There will possibly and probably be changes. And those changes may not be good changes for you. A couple other examples, which I think are important to consider. Now, this isn't just professional speculation. Some of what I just talked about was just professional speculation. But there are actual changes that are occurring. Um, I will tell you that some of those organizations now, um, they no longer can offer some of the services or the programs they used to. Okay. Um, they are no longer giving out releases. We talked about this earlier. Some of those organizations are being much more difficult when it comes to the release process. They're holding some agents hostage. They're making it very difficult for agents to move to another organization. Okay, that is happening because somebody who now owns and how, who now makes those decisions are deciding that that's their new practice. The other thing that's happening is these organizations have gotten so big that they have to be very compliance heavy. Okay. Now, that's some of the advantages of working with an FMO. So we're not an insurance carrier. Um, we have different obligations. We have different oversight. We have different requirements. But some of these organizations now are treating this like they're insurance companies. They've got compliance teams, and they are following every rule to the letter of their interpretation. Okay, So in the past, where maybe they allowed for certain lead programs, or they were willing to co-op and um, contribute to some of those leader marketing programs, see, those are no longer compliant. They'll no longer approve those. So maybe the reason why you went to work for that organization has just been eliminated. And that is happening today. Those are real life examples of things that are happening to organizations that have been acquired by either private equity firms or publicly traded companies. So be mindful that those are real changes that will affect you. Those are potential changes that could affect you. So be mindful. And again, I'm not saying that these organizations are bad. Some of them are very good. But what they are today may be very different from what they are tomorrow. So just be mindful of that when you're making a decision for your business uh, and your partner, uh, your FMO partner. So next, and this is maybe a bit out of order, but we are going to talk about what the purpose of an FMO is. Why should you partner with an FMO? Does it cost you anything to partner with an FMO? Which it should. But we're going to talk about that important question. What is an FMO and how can they contribute to my business? So let's get into that. We've got a few really exciting things to point out to help you decide whether that's right or wrong for your business. And as we just talked about, some of the tips and things to avoid. So let's get into the purpose of an FMO and how it can contribute to your business's success.